Hello and welcome to Lady Dynamite Creates. This is Tiffany and today I decided that it was time to venture back into my favorite, the realm of fantasy, and tackle something that's been on my I want to make that list for a couple of years now. It's finally time to make a fawn. I chose Howleen Wool for my base doll. I really love this face sculpt with her cute button nose and more youthful appearance. I prep the head by first buzzing her hair down very short with my electric razor. I make this as short as possible to make it easier to remove the plugs later. With the hair removed, I pop her into some boiled water for several minutes to help soften the vinyl. With the vinyl nice and squishy, I pull her head off, but disaster struck. I broke the neck peg. I decided this was future Tiffany's problem and I moved forward anyway. After the decapitation, I shoved the screwdriver through her neck hole and I scraped the inside of her head to loosen the hair plugs and glue. Out of context, I sound like a psycho. This doll has a lot of glue in her hair and it was pretty tough to remove all of the plugs, but when I finally had them loosened, I used my needle nose pliers to pull out the gluey mess. I want my fawn to have floppy ears on the side of her head, so these wolf ears have to go. I use my X-Acto knife to slice them off. And remember when I said there was a lot of glue? I mean, there was a lot of glue. Look at this huge chunk. With the head prepped, I can move on to sculpting the horns and ears, but first I need to take care of these pesky holes where the old ears used to be. I heat up small pieces of warbla and mash them into place and cover the holes. Now I can make the armature for the horns. I pre-drill three holes into the warbler and insert wires into each hole and guide it out through the neck hole. I take the ends of the wires at the neck and make small loops into the bottom of them. This will act as a stopper to prevent the wire from tearing out of the head. I pull the wires back so that the stopper is snug against the inside of the head. I can now twist the wires and form my desired shape for the horns. I did the ear armatures the exact same way, only with two wires that are connected instead of three. Here's the head with the final armature, now to slap on some clay. I'm using epoxy sculpt, uh, epoxy sculpt Super White, which is a two-part epoxy clay. I've mixed up some off camera and I've created two balls of equal size. I do this to ensure my horns stay close in the same size while I'm sculpting them. I roll one of the balls out into a cone shape and then I use my knife to split the clay down the middle and then I can start wrapping that around the armature. I get it smooth with my hands first, then I move on to giving it more defined shapes and textures with my ball stylus. The nice thing about working on fantasy creatures is being able to pull reference from a lot of different places. For instance, she has smooth horns like a wildebeest with flowing ridges that follow the direction of the horn, while the horn shape itself is similar to that of a barrel. Epoxy sculpt leaves behind a residue where it has touched, so before the clay has time to fully cure, I clean it with acetone. After the clay is cured, I can get started on the paint job. Off camera, I got a base color applied for the horns and ears, and I swear it took me forever to land on the color for the horns. I think I painted them three or four times before I was happy. It just kept being too light or too dark or just not right. I give the horns darker tones toward the tips and in between the ridges, and then I dry brush on a lighter color to the high points. Since my ridge sculpting was very shallow, I found it easier to do some of the shading with my pastels instead of paint. Now for the body mods. I pull these two legs out of my parts bin and I harvest the joint for the ungully grade legs. I've marked where I'll be cutting on the legs, making sure that I'm far enough away from the joint mechanism so that it's not damaged with my cuts. I did decide to exchange the broken neck peg doll for a different one for my stop box. 
I want to try the method Delightful shows where she basically made a ball at the end like the Creata Monster dolls have, but I was worried the horns and ears would cause issues with weight, so I put the doll back into my stock box to use for later. I drilled holes through the leg parts and began attaching these with wire, and there is a lot of struggling, and I finally managed to get them attached. Delightful just makes this look so much easier. The thing I did dislike about the last doll I made with ungully gray legs was when I changed the position of her legs, the hooves would no longer be flat, so this time I wanted to add a joint there. I have these joints that are used to create your own mecha figures, so I'll be using them to create the ankle. I cut the foot off and drilled a hole to house the joint, and I glued it in place. I make sure there's no glue squeeze out that'll affect the movement later on. Here's how she looks after those modifications, so I can now start slapping on that clay. I'm once again using epoxy sculpt super white to bulk her up and hide all of the unsightly wire pieces. And in this case, I do wish I had some of the darker clay because while the super white is great when you paint with light colors, it's bad for the darker ones. I add a little clay at a time and work in small sections because when I try to sculpt too much at once, I always wind up damaging previously sculpted areas. I use my fingers and a bit of water to smooth out the clay. The smoother that it is here, the less sanding I have to do later. Now for her hooves. This ankle joint, while I love the functionality, I hated how hard it made sculpting. The clay kept falling off and moving while I was trying to sculpt, and I had finally had it, so I found this hoof for a BJD on Thingiverse. So I made a few changes and printed it to use here. I drilled a hole and glued it in place. I was so frustrated and mad that at the time I didn't even think about the fact that I could have just sculpted my own hooves off the doll and then just drilled them on like this. Sometimes it's just so hard to see through the red haze of things not going to plan. The big joint is rather unsightly so I wanted to sculpt a cupped area on top of it that still allows for movement but hides the joint for the most part. I carefully wrap the joint in clean film to keep the clay from damaging it and get to sculpting. After this, there is hours of sanding, and I did this off camera because I hate sanding inside, and I didn't feel like lugging all of my camera equipment outside. With the doll sanded, I can now give her a base coat of paint because I don't want white parts peeking through her fur. I really don't know what was up with this brown paint I chose, but for some reason it kept flanking off, so I wound up having to remove it all and spraying her with a primer base paint later on. Off camera, I made some short wefts for her fur, and let me tell you, I needed so much more than I thought I needed. I made wefts four different times. I apply these to the doll with a bit of hot glue, and I'm very careful around the joints because I don't want to accidentally glue them. And around and around we go, all the way up the legs. I found it easiest to do one leg at a time and then to trim it up before moving on to the other leg. Here is the difference in the legs before and after trimming. To trim the fur, I used my pet hair brush and I brushed the fur to stick straight out and then trimmed it with the scissors. This helped create a more natural looking taper to the fur when it was brushed down. After I'm finally happy with the length, I try to tame it a bit using a wet toothbrush. I actually hold off on adding the skin transition for now because I do want to blush her body to help create a more natural look first. This fawn needs some clothing and I decided armor was the way to go. I sculpted a few armor pieces and a weapon for her in 3D Studio Max. When I sculpt in 3D, I work in low poly and use modifiers to upscale my models. So here you can see the before the modifier and after. I learned 3D modeling when I was working in video games and I worked primarily on the DS which required much lower poly counts and old habits die hard. I export my model and bring them into the slicing software so that I can prep them for printing. I make sure to repair any holes in my mesh and I scale them to the right dimensions. I auto generate these supports and clean up any islands or supports that are not ideal and then I set this to print on my Elegoo Mars 3 printer, and they turned out so beautiful. 
The level of detail on these prints is just phenomenal and I'm amazed every time. I get the prints cleaned up and apply a coat of spray primer before I jump into painting them. I'm using a Vallejo model color for the base. I find this paint to be very opaque requiring fewer coats and has a very smooth finish. I use small nail art brushes and try to paint as neatly as possible and while it looks like I'm painting super fast this footage has been sped up a lot. Key here is to take your time. Normally I would paint in the shadows and the highlights with paint but we're having some extreme heat here in Southern California and paint was drying on my brush before I could even put it to the surface. Instead, I gave the paints a coat of MSC and used pastels for my highlights and shadows. I seal all of that in and apply a semi-gloss varnish on top and then I get started on the gold trim. For this, I use gilding paint and I love the metallic effect it gives off. I am very careful when applying the paint and have my pieces taped to a rod for easier handling and while I paint I steady my breathing and I rest my pinky finger on the rod to help stabilize my painting hand. I just love how these turned out and I am a sucker for green and gold armor. I mean, look how pretty this is. Now I can add the attachments. I have left areas paint free where straps will be added. I found through trial and error that when gluing painted prints, the glue tends to adhere to only the paint layer and it will easily detach. I apply a bit of super glue and I attach leather straps. I wanted to take a moment and thank all of my friends over on Patreon. I'm so grateful to them for their support of my art. Angel Book Walter, B. Burnett, Deborah Sweeney, Star FML, Stephanie L, Manders, Delicious, Amber S, Awkward Burb, Vex Mini Studio, Camille, Dancing Johari, Kitsy, K Whip L, and the Oak Magpie. For her weapon, I felt like a spear was fitting, and I modeled and printed this one for her as well. This time, I actually remembered to give it a handle so she can hold it without rubber bands. Now it's time to get started on the face up. Here are all the supplies I've used to paint her face, various watercolor pencils, pastels, and mica powders. I do have a full list of my supplies in the description box below if you're interested. Before I get started, I prep her with three coats of Mr. Super Clear UV Cut Flat, and I wait at least 30 minutes between each layer, and then I get started. My original concept for this doll was a very sweet, carefree, spirited fawn with flowing chiffon trains and flowers adorning her, but as I worked on her, she started to change in my mind. This is a big reason why I like to have a more fluid, loose concept while I work because things on paper don't always work well in the real world. I think the big turning point was the shaggy fur. I felt like the two textures would have been at odds and I just wasn't feeling it. This is where she started being less of a fawn and more of a fawn satyr hybrid, at least in my mind. Fawn and satyr are both similar creatures with goat legs and human upper bodies, but other than both having a love for music, their personality traits tend to be vastly different. Fawns are from Roman mythology and are often depicted as shy, gentle creatures that represent pastoral, carefree life, while satyr are from Greek mythology and are rowdy and they seek a hedonistic existence. Falling firmly into either category just didn't feel right for the character I was imagining, so I decided she would be a bit of both. The obvious choice would be to make her a bard given the music-loving nature of both fantasy creatures, but I decided that was just a bit too obvious a choice, so a warrior forest guardian would suit her better. I wanted her to be a bit headstrong and adventurous, however, she has a deep commitment to her duty as a guardian of the forest. She doesn't go around picking fights, but she also doesn't shy away from violence when it's needed. I think I will eventually make the original fawn concept with the flowing chiffon and flowers. I think she would make a great big sister to this girl, leaning into the more fantastical colorings to really push the dichotomy of the two sisters. I think I would make her more in line with how I did my Lust Demon with painted legs but adding a small amount of feathering around her hooves. I think that would help with the fighting contrast of textures, but that'll be a project for another day. What do you guys think? Is that a project you would like to see me tackle? Comment below and let me know. While I was working on her face up, her personality became more cemented in my head and I tried to convey that as well as I could. 
I feel like because of her fluffy butt and youthful appearance that her foes greatly underestimate her and she uses this to her advantage. I think I managed to impart her cocky attitude into her expression. I did want to take a second to thank you all for your support and for being so patient waiting on new content. Over the last few weeks, my social media on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok have all gotten loads of love and I greatly appreciate the support. These larger complex projects definitely seem to be favored by you guys and the mystical YouTube algorithm, but they are so labor intensive. It just takes me such a long time to make these projects because I make everything myself. As you probably noticed, the face-up did give me a bit of trouble. I erased the eyes several times because I just couldn't get them right. This has happened to me a lot lately, and I don't know if I'm just rushing or what, but I find myself erasing eyes constantly these days. I am really happy with how they ultimately turned out, and I think the irises are some of my best ones yet. The eyelashes turned out a bit fluffier than I planned, but I think it still works. I wanted to really pump up the contrast on the lighter striations in her eyes, and pencils just weren't going to cut it, so I used my white watercolor wet and applied it with a brush. Once it dried, I dusted neon green pastels to tint the painted area. It gave her eyes this glowing quality. I really love it. The nose was another thing I was glad I did. I was unsure of it at first. And while I didn't change the sculpt, I added the dark shading to pull it into more of an animalistic feature. I apply the catch lights and highlights to the water lines and give a dusting of mica powder for the finishing touches. I think she turned out fierce but super cute. I love, love, love her. Now I can move on to the body blushing. I waited until I was finished with the face up to tackle this because I want to use the same colors here that I used on her face. I really pile on the darker shading at the fur transition so that it looks more natural. I simply follow the contours of the body and darken areas that tend to be in shadow like the hollows of her collarbone and highlight high points like the swells of her breast and stomach. To get rid of the harsh line of wefts, I'm now going to apply some flocking. I made the flocking by cutting yarn into super small pieces. I apply matte Mod Podge to the transition area and I pile on the flock. Once it's dried, I can brush off the excess. Our wild girl does need some hair, but before I can add it, I want to flock her ears. For the outside of the ears, I'm going to use the same color as her legs, but for the inside, I flock them in shades of pink. Now I start adding in the rows of hair. I start at the nape of the neck and I work my way up, securing the wefts with a bit of hot glue. Normally I flat iron my wefts, but the texture on this yarn was so wonderful I felt like it fit this character because it's not like they're flat irons out in the woods. Bars hair, I don't care. When I get to the area around the horns, I fold the wefts over so they have a neater appearance since those areas are visible. I do the same to the wefts on the front of her hairline. And just like that, she's done. You will remember this is where we started, and here's where we ended up. I have decided to call her Minerva the Just after Minerva the Roman goddess of wisdom, justice, law, and strategic war. I felt like it was a fitting name for a guardian of the forest and also pays homage to the Roman origins of fawns. If you are interested in Minerva, she's available for purchase on my Etsy store. Just look for the link in the description box below. I want to thank you so much for watching, and remember, always be creating.